Okay, maybe let's get started. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming back. I hope you had a good lunch. Um, okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is something called reinforcement learning. Um, so the presentation today is going to be like through a use case. So I'm going to talk about mainly one use case where we use the reinforcement learning. But the idea of this talk is really to present, to, to talk more on the methods because that's the theme of the day. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be very happy to discuss more about like, uh, um, the, um, like the, the problem itself and so on, but I'm going to try to emphasize more on the method side of things. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll motivate first a bit the, the, the problem that we're going to work on. Um, and hopefully with this approach of like um, presenting through a use case, you'll be able to map to your own problem um, and how you could use reinforcement learning for, for that particular problem, okay? So, so let me motivate a bit the, the problem that we'll be considering today, which is the topic of algorithmic discovery. So the, the project essentially started with a very simple question. The question was, can we use machine learning to discover new provably correct, efficient algorithms for impactful problems? So there are three key words here. Provably correct, meaning that we are trying to find algorithms that are correct everywhere, right? So we want to get certificates of correctness of the algorithms, right? So we don't just want to have an algorithm that is correct, let's say, for example, on some, some test distribution, um, where we don't have any certificate. We really want to have some algorithm for which we know for sure that this is going to work for any uh, test point, for any matrices in our case. Efficient, uh, this can mean ma many different things, but we'll be talking essentially about um, computational complexity and uh, actual uh, latency. And then impactful problems. So we want to focus on what we call root node problems in the sense that uh, if we are able to um, find good algorithms for these problems, then this will unlock many other problems, okay? So this was the question that we started with. And why did we focus on this question? Because if we're able to design new algorithms uh, with machine learning that are able to improve um, an existing algorithm, then the potential can be just huge, right? Because these algorithms are used everywhere. So from your smartphone to many other applications, if you're able to improve these algorithms, then that that's, um, has a huge impact. Now, obviously, it's not as an easy challenge, right? Be uh, I mean, there is a number of challenges as associated to this, because um, if you think about the space of possible algorithms, this is a very weird space, right? And if you add on top of that the condition that you want to have an, uh, algorithms that are provably correct everywhere, then it's actually very hard to define precisely what is this space looks like. Even if you're able to define uh, the space, it's usually very hard to search in, right? Because this space is usually huge, as we've seen. So this is um, quite a challenge in terms of uh, using reinforcement learning for these kind of problems. But we'll see, like, through uh, some ingredients, how we can try to overcome that. And that will echo a lot the, the talks that we've seen before from Sebastian and from Alex on how we can use transformers and how we can embed symmetries and so on. So as I said, uh, we'll be focusing on matrix multiplication because um, I'm sure you're, you're all agree that matrix multiplication is one of those root node problems um, like um, that essentially have an effect on many other uh, um, problems, in particular neural network training, simulation, solving linear systems, and so on and so forth. So um, the, the, the first part of my talk, I'll be formalizing the problem of finding matrix multiplication algorithms as a machine learning problem. So it, it might sound first a bit strange. How can you take this problem of like finding algorithms for matrix multiplication and cast it as a machine learning problem? It doesn't sound direct. How can you do this? So we'll go um, step by step on, on seeing how we can, we can do that. And then I'll talk about four ingredients that are needed to make machine learning work in this particular problem. But we think this, this is also applicable to, uh, to other problems in science and math. Uh, I'll go through the results and then we'll have a discussion and concluding remarks. Okay, so first things first, uh, what is matrix multiplication? Uh, I'm sure you're all, you're all familiar with this, but uh, let me just set the notations. Uh, so let's say that you want to multiply two two by two matrices, then what you're doing is essentially this times this plus this times this and so on. 
So the classroom algorithm that we were taught uh, at high school uh, is exactly like shown uh, here. Okay, so it, it involves eight scalar multiplications, right? So for example, uh, C11, you're going to get it by A11, B11 plus A12, B21, right? Um, so it involves like eight multiplications for two for a two by two matrix, um, matrix multiplication. Now, this was thought for a very long time to be the best algorithm possible. But um, a German mathematician in 1969 sh shocked the mathematical community by showing actually that there is better than that. And the algorithm that he came up with is actually quite strange, uh, very unintuitive, in the sense that um, what you need to do is to combine entries of these matrices together prior to multiplying them. Right. So, so for example, in this case here, you're going to add A11 plus A22, and then you're going to multiply it by B11 plus B22, and then you're going to like distribute things in a very strange fashion. <coughs> so this is not interpretable. It's an algorithm that is hard to come up with. Like if you have an empty sheet of paper, it's, it's kind of hard to come up with, but it's very easy to check. Right. So it's just some algebraic computations, and you can check very easily that this this actually works. <laughs> Now, the, the reason why Strassen's algorithm is so powerful is uh, really that it goes beyond two, uh, two by two matrices. You can apply these algorithms recursively. So let's say you, you, want to, you want to multiply two n by n matrices. So what you can do is that you separate these matrices into, or like, into blocks of uh, n over two times n over two n matrices, right? And then you use Strassen's algorithm on blocks, right? But you can recurse, like you don't just need to do one step, you can recurse over and over again. So what you get is an algorithm of complexity n to the power of log base two of seven, okay? Uh, seven, because it involves seven scalar multiplications, like the seven here, right? The number of scalar multiplications. Um, and log base two, because we're going to, we're applying this recursively, right? So this, this was the first algorithm that went beyond the cubic algorithm, um, um, the classroom algorithm, essentially. And this was, as I said, a, a huge deal uh, in 1969. Now, the first time you look at this, you probably would agree with me that maybe machines could come up with this better than we can, right? Because, yeah, I mean, there is very little to um, intuition really to, to have here. Um, so, so that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to see how machines can come up with this kind of uh, algorithms automatically. So to see, to see how we can do this, let me uh, map from the language of algorithms to, lang to the language of uh, like uh, tensors, right? Um, so this, in, like by describing the language, things in the language of tensors, we'll be able to um, describe the search space in a, in, a, in a more efficient way. Okay, so um, linear maps, you can represent these as matrices, just like linear maps, you can represent these as matrices, bilinear maps and matrix multiplication is one bilinear map, you can represent it as a tensor. Okay, so in particular, there is what we call the matrix multiplication tensor associated to the um, to the matrix multiplication operation, which is bilinear, as I just said, and it's of dimension n square by n square by n square. Okay, so for example, for uh, the two by two case that we just studied, it's a four by four by four tensor, and this tensor is independent of the matrices that you want to multiply. So we're really operating here at the at the operation level, right, rather than um, like at the matrices level, okay? So this, oper this, this tensor captures the operation of multiplying two matrices, okay? So it's a tensor made up of zeros and ones, okay? In particular, it has like eight ones and the rest is zeros. So here, this tensor here is like four by four by four, as I said, and it has eight ones. And it has ones for the places where you have uh, scalar multiplications, okay? So A21 times B12, so you can look at, okay, this, this um, coordinate here, A21, B12, and because you're going to write this in C22, so this corresponds to putting a one in the, um, uh, in the, in, in the coordinate corresponding to A21, B12, C22, okay? And you're going to do this for every multiplication. So therefore you'll get eight ones and the rest are going to be zeros your entries, okay? So for example, this one, you're also going to be to put a one and so on. And as, as I said, this tensor is independent of the matrices you want to multiply. This is really at the operator level. Okay, so this is the operation of matrix multiplication, how you can um, 
uh, you can express it using tensors, and we'll see how, why, this, why is this interesting. Yeah. So you can change the basis. You can change the basis, and then you get a different cube. So that's, that represents the operation of matrix multiplication in the canonical basis. So that's not an algorithm, that's the operation. We, I haven't talked about algorithms yet. It's the next slide. Yeah. An algorithm is the it can cor it corresponds to a low rank decomposition of this tensor, okay? Um, so what is a low rank decomposition of a tensor? It's very similar to what you know already uh, as a low rank decomposition of a matrix. So remember that the low rank decomposition of a matrix, you write it as, a, as the sum of UQ, VQ transpose, right? But here we have a three tensor, right? It's a three dimensional tensor. So we have a third mode. And so we have the tensor uh, product between UQ, VQ, and WQ. And this tensor product is just the generalization of this outer product. And UQ is a vector of dimension n square because we said um, the tensor is of dimension n square by n square by n square. OK? Um, yeah, so you're summing this. Uh, and then you get, you're summing like rank one tensors, and then, and then the idea is to get this tensor, um, uh, this matrix multiplication tensor, okay? So this is just a pictorial representation of, um, of, of this like decomposition. Now, when you have a low rank decomposition like that, then you can map it directly to a matrix multiplication algorithm to multiply any matrices A and B, okay? And this is the algorithm. Okay, so like if you have any A and B that you want to multiply, then you can use this UQ, VQ, and WQ that parameterize your algorithm uh, in order to do this matrix multiplication. Okay. Now, the important quantity here is the rank of this decomposition that you're going to find. And the rank characterizes precisely the computational complexity of this algorithm. You can apply the algorithm recursively. Right? So you can apply it really to any size matrices, not only for multiplying n by n matrices. Okay? So it's a general algorithm for multiplying n by n matrices. Now, the question therefore um, becomes really to, to try to find the decompositions of this tensor that have the minimum rank. Okay? Let's, let's try to, to see this mapping between uh, tensors, algorithms, like tensors, decompositions, and algorithms um, with the Strassen's example. So uh, remember that Strassen's algorithm was this thing here, right? Um, so how do we map this algorithm here to factors? Well, you just actually like report things. So you have like here A11 plus A22. So you're going to put in the first mode here a 1001. You have here B11 plus B22. So you again, you again have a 1001. And you have here, you're going to distribute H1 here and H1 here. So again, you have a 1, 0, 0, 1. So the first two modes, you can think of them as being like what to multiply with what. And the third mode is going to say, okay, like how do I distribute things when I, when I compute these uh, intermediate results, okay? Okay, so, um, so, so we really like, converted the problem of like finding fast algorithms for matrix multiplication to finding low rank decompositions of this matrix multiplication tensor, which I just talked about. Now, unfortunately, unlike matrices, tensor decompositions are really hard. Like even for small tensors, it's a really hard problem. Um, so th this is exactly where we're going to use machine learning for, to compute the low rank decompositions of the, of the matrix multiplication tensor. Okay, so we're going to model it as a game, okay? Because uh, DeepMind, we love playing games. So, so let's try to, 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 to model that as a, as a particular game where like if we solve this game well, then we'll have fast algorithms to multiply matrices. So we're going to, our board is going to be a 3D board, okay? So you have this, you're going to, the, the starting board is going to be this matrix multiplication tensor that you want to decompose. And then at each step, each, like the move that you would do, it corresponds to essentially like subtracting a rank one tensor. Okay, you, you like you have like a lot of action, a lot of possible actions. Each action like corresponds to essentially like removing a, sub, a rank one tensor. Okay, you get a new a new board. Okay, and then you're going to repeat. You're going to try to subtract a rank one tensor from it, and so on and so forth. And your goal, like you win, the player wins, um, if uh, you get to the zero tensor at the very end. Okay, you want to get to the zero tensor. Now, you don't want to just get to the zero tensor in any way. You want to find the fastest way of reaching the zero tensor. Okay, 
So that's why you're going to give a negative one reward at each step, so that you're kind of like penalized at each step. And then at the end, you're going to give a, a reward that corresponds to, an, uh, to some penalty if you didn't reach this, uh, uh, this um, zero tensor, because you don't want to end up with games that you know, like get played indefinitely, right? So you have to stop at some point and say, okay, like if I, if I play really poorly, then just stop and then penalize that with the fact that you didn't really find any zero tensor at the end, okay? <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. I I mean that's the goal, right? We want to get to the zero tensor. The, is the question like why do we, why do we care about the zero tensor? Yeah. Yeah. So this, if you get the, the zero tensor, then this means that you find a sum of rank one tensors that get exactly to this matrix multiplication tensor. Think about like inverting the process essentially. You start with the matrix multiplication tensor, and then you subtract at each step a rank one tensor till you arrive to the zero tensor. So that, that means that essentially the sum is equal to the matrix multiplication. Okay, now there is a, a large number of difficulties associated to this problem. Um, there is a huge action space. Actually, the action space is infinite because the number of rank one tensors is just infinite. Um, there is uh, n very little training, I mean, no training data. So unlike games like uh, Go, where, we have, where you have like expert uh, games online, uh, that you can use to maybe like uh, start uh, reinforce like start your training your model um, you don't have any training data so you have to come up with maybe clever solutions you only have one tensor to, to decompose and that's i think a common problem in science and math in particular where you care about just proving one theorem or like decomposing one tensor um, so how do we put more diversity in the procedure right because if you have just one one game one board that you want to decompose then it's going to play the game over and over and again, and then it's not going to essentially go away from its mistakes. You can think of it as like being stuck into this local minima, and it would be very hard for it to, kind of, to, get, to get out of it. And then tensors are really an embodiment of symmetries. Like you can, uh, there are so many symmetries associated to this. Like for example, you have um, decompositions, you can permute any you know, like factors and it will work, it will be an equivalent decomposition. You have, the, you have your tensor, you can permute slices, uh, you'll have the same rank and so on. So that's really um, something that you want to take into account as much as possible. So let me just maybe compare uh, this game with the game of Go. Um, so as I said, in terms of actions, um, this is like much larger than Go. So Go, you have a board of roughly like 19 by 19, right? So we have around 300, I mean, not roughly, like 19 by 19. You have, I think, 362 uh, um, actions, uh, which corresponds to 19 by 19 minus one. Um, now, compared to, to this game here, if you discretize, I mean, as I said, your, your action space can be infinite, but if you discretize, then even then, the number of actions will just grow, grow exponentially with the dimension of the, um, um, of the tensor, right? So your action space here, for example, is 10 to the 8, 10 to the 18, like for different size matrices, right? So this is, for example, the matrix multiplication tensor corresponding to 4 by 4 matrices, which is like a 16 by 16 by 16 tensor, you have an action space of 10 to the power of 33. So how to navigate in that uh, huge search uh, space. Okay, so what I'll be trying to describe here is essentially like using reinforcement learning and tree search to try to navigate in that huge space, right? So, so at each step, what we will try to do is to essentially like do a tree search, do a lot of simulations, um, pick the, the, the action that works the best, um, remove it from the from the current state and then repeat and so on, right? So the question is, how do you identify that needle in a haystack, right? And we're going to use um, alpha zero and uh, neural networks in order to try to, to really like find these um, needles in a haystack. Okay, so as I said, we're going to try to use alpha zero. So what is alpha zero? Alpha zero is this um, reinforcement learning algorithm um, which has proved to be extremely successful in playing games like Go and chess, but it's also like a very general one, like that can be used for this kind of problem or like more generic, like discrete optimization problems. So the underlying idea behind it is that you have two components, actors and a learner, okay? So you can think of actors as like computers like that play in parallel many, many different games, okay? Um, so you're going to, at each step, you're going to do this tree search, okay? 
uh, do a lot of simulations, a lot of simulations, right? Um, and in the beginning, you're not going to play really well, right? So, so uh, your, your simulations are essentially going to be random, right? So the, the decompositions that you're going to find in the beginning are actually really bad. But that's fine. That's just the, the first step. What you're going to do is that you're going to collect all these games that have been played uh, by the actors, and then you're going to send them to the second component, which is called the learner. Okay, and then what the learner is going to try to do is that it's going to try to imitate these uh, games that have been played by the actors. Okay, so the learner, what it's going to do is that it's going to try to sample one of these states uh, that have been played, and then try to predict two things. What is my next move? And how good am I currently? Like, how good is my current board, essentially? Or in this in this uh, terms, how what is the estimate of the rank of my current tensor? Okay. So the policy and the value are just going to try to imitate what's going to what's going to be in the data that has been sent to you by the actors. Okay. By predicting, as I said, for the policy, you're going to try to predict what was what was the next action that was taken, and for the value, how how good was my current position? Now, you're going to, to train the network for a few steps, right? And then you're going to send back your network to the actors, okay? Now, the actors, hopefully, at the next iteration are going to be a, a little bit better than the first iteration. So they're not going to do, like, random simulations, but they're going to be, like, guided by the, by the, by the neural network. So you can think of the policy and the value as like a starting baseline, and then hopefully with this Monte Carlo tree search that you're going to do at each step, you're going to improve a little bit over the actions that have been um, um, like the, the, the actions of the neural network. Okay, so you can think of this Monte Carlo tree search that you're doing at each step as some sort of like policy improvement operator, some some sort of like way to improve uh, the predictions of your neural network. Okay. Now, you're going to hopefully, therefore, generate better games that you're going to send to the learner to make more, like the learner would make more sense of it, like would try to, to, um, to, to imitate those results. And then you're going to use, again, this uh, neural network as a starting baseline to generate better games and so on and so forth. So it's a sort of like a self-reinforcing um, method where actors get better and learner kind of tries to learn what the actors have, have been doing. Um, and, and therefore, like, you get better and better actors and, and better and better games. Um, is this clear? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so the actor is, is, uh, is going to apply, like, a Monte Carlo tree search approach at each step, okay? And this tree search algorithm uses a neural network. So it, you can think of it as, um, so it's it going to use the value and the policy to guide this tree search, okay? So it's going to try to look at nodes where the, the, the value is good uh, or the policy is good, right? But it's also going to try to look at places that haven't been explored previously, okay? So, so it's going to, you can think of it as like starting from the, 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 the values of the learner, but then like hopefully through random exploration, it's going to get better. Sorry? The reward for the actor. Yeah. So it comes from the simulation, the random. Uh, no, so the, the, so, this, so at each step, you're actually going to do like, let's say, a thousand simulation. Okay, so let's say you're in this starting position. Okay, you're going to do a thousand simulation, right? So you're going to construct this tree, very big tree. And then after you construct this very big tree, you're going to take a decision to go to the next step. Okay. And then you're going to start again 1,000 1, more simulations, and then you're going to go to the next step and so on. So the reward is given at each step you make, right? Yeah. So yeah. the decision of choosing which decision to take is related somehow to the output coming from the learner? Yeah, so the learner is, is providing these baseline values, right? This policy and value. And then I didn't put the formulas here, not to complicate things, but essentially you're going to use these policy and value um, to guide your tree search, right? So, so therefore the network is very important for the actors, right? So. Okay. 
Okay, now, um, how much? Okay. okay, so now, as I said, alpha zero applied to this problem, like, basic, like vanilla alpha zero applied to this problem won't work um, because as I said, like the action space is huge and so on. So what I'll be trying to talk about is essentially like four important ingredients that you need to add in order to make this work, right? Um, okay, so the first, the first ingredient is to generate data, right? Um, so if you want to train powerful machine learning models, you need a lot of data. Um, but here, like in, in, in many math problems, you don't have a lot of data, so you need instead to rely on, on synthetic data. So the, the, this kind of problem uh, falls, I think, in a category of problems that are quite interesting in the sense that they are one-way problems. So like it's very hard to get uh, a decomposition from a tensor, as I just said, but the opposite is quite easy. So you can generate uh, random uh, decompositions and then generate the tensor associated to it, right? Uh, so in that way, you can generate an infinite amount of training data, right? Just by starting from the decomposition and then by combining this together, you get the tensor, okay? So essentially like it's this sum formula I showed before, right? So you have this uh, rank one tensor, you sum them and then you get the, uh, the, the, the final tensor, okay? So you can generate like uh, pairs of tensor, decomposition, tensor, decomposition for the decompositions that you generated randomly. Okay, uh, so what's nice uh, also in, in, in by if you generate the synthetic data is that th that's one way you could try to impose some symmetries um, um, by essentially like generating data that observes some symmetries. For example, let's say you want decompositions uh, that are of the form like uh, if, if there is a factor that is UVW, then there is also VWU and WUV, then you can generate like uh, uh, decompositions in this way. Um, so, so what we have is two sources of data, the data that comes from the actors and the data that comes from the synthetic data. And what we've found empirically is that this kind of synthetic data is very useful, especially at the beginning of training, right? So it's essentially like giving information about what the whole problem is about, what this tensor decomposition problem is about. Um, and then like it's using, like later on in training, it's going to be uh, uh, using more the, the data coming from the actors that is more on distribution. Obviously, one of the problems with generating synthetic data is that um, it can be far, far from the target. So here, for example, the synthetic data that you're generating is random, and it doesn't have the same symmetries as the, as the matrix multiplication tensor and so on, right? Um, so it's like, from a distribution point of view, it's quite far from the actual thing that you care about. But we found still to be very useful at the beginning of training. Okay, uh, another, um, another uh, ingredient which I mentioned previously is to try to diversify your targets, right? Um, so this is one of these problems where you only care about one target, one theorem, one tensor. Uh, if you solve it, you're good. If you don't, then yeah, you don't care about the other things. So the way we, we can do this, and there is like different ways as, as, as Sebastian was saying, the way we did this is essentially through data augmentation. and um, so you have, you have this matrix multiplication tensor, which you care about, as I said. So what you can do is that you can generate random change of basis, right? Which um, therefore generate other tensors that are equivalent. We know for sure they are equivalent to the original tensor in terms of like, if you decompose this other tensor, then you have automatically a decomposition for the original tensor because you can just apply the inverse transform, right? Um, so you can generate all these uh, random um, uh, like a change of basis, and then consider all these um, at once, like each time you're going to play, you select a random uh, change of basis, you apply to your matrix multiplication tensor, and then you play that game in that basis, okay? This was very important. Like if you consider only the, the tensor in the canonical basis, then you're going to fall over and over again in the same mistakes that you have done before. One pictorial way maybe of seeing this is that um, by doing this, um, um, by doing this um, transformation, like this change of basis, you get closer to your synthetic data, which I just generated, right? So um, you get more like a random like tensors. So the nice thing, as I said, is that whenever you get uh, decomposition from one of these, you can propagate that information to all the others. A third ingredient that is um, very important is to train generalist agents rather than experts, or like uh, experts specific to particular targets. So, I mean, one way 
one way you could tackle the problem is to say, okay, um, I'm going to train an agent to rediscover Strassen, right? To, to essentially uh, find algorithms for multiplying two by two matrices, right? Um, but that's not going to be as good as training an agent to decompose all tensors at the same time. What happens is that there is a positive transfer between the different targets, right? Um, so, for example, like, like the techniques it finds for multiplying three by three times three by four somewhat, somewhat transfer to uh, multiplying two by two times two by two matrices. We're actually quite surprised by the amount of transfer that is happening between targets um, that should not have any relation or like we don't know any mathematical relations between them. So, for example, like if we only had transfer between uh, multiplying four by four matrices and two by two matrices, then that could be understandable because we could do this by doing just twice two by two matrices. But we had actually like transfer between uh, matrices that don't uh, share anything in common, at least a priori. We also had transfer between different fields. So we trained just one agent to decompose uh, tensors in different fields. And this was also very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, so you can, you can do ablations, right? So you can try to, uh, let's say, for example, you want to test if this, uh, like finding algorithms for this is interesting for this. So you could try to remove that, um, that particular size here from, the, from your experiment and see if it recovers the other, uh, the other result for that. Okay, so as I said, this, is, this was very important to, to really beat, um, go beyond state of the art. Um, but also, it's, it's just more efficient, right? If you were to, to train an agent for each particular size, for each particular field and so on, and you want to tackle a large number of problems, then that, that can just be a, a prohibitive in terms of um, uh, computational efficiency. Okay, the last uh, ingredient I'd like to talk about is to train large and deep uh, uh, tailored neural networks. Uh, so you remember that in the learner, what we had is this um, it is this neural network that tries to um, predict what is going to be the next move and what is the value, right? Uh, so you could consider many different architectures for that, but the architectures really matter, okay? So like if you consider, let's say, a convolution neural network, it just won't work because tensors don't have the same uh, symmetries as, uh, as a Go board, for example, where spatial symmetry is, is, is very important. Um, so you have to really find uh, architectures for which uh, that kind of embed the inductive biases that you have in your um, in your problem. So the architecture we consider it is like um, has a torso, which is a common uh, neural network to both policy and value. Okay, so you have like this, well, yeah, this um, like three neural networks if you want, which is the first one being the torso, the second one to, pr to take the output of the torso and predict what is going to be my next action. And then the, the value takes the output of the torso and predicts the value, okay? So, so let me tell you a bit more about like what the torso looks like in, in our case. Um, so the way we did this is uh, uh, the first step is to project um, this tensor that you have into three grids of features, okay? So, um, so you could work with the tensor, but the problem is that this is like quite bulky to work with. And then we want to do self-attention and so on. So this is going to be quite expensive. So instead what we do is that we, we apply three linear layers um, to get three different uh, uh, grids of features. So you can think of it as like three different views of your tensor, okay? Corresponding each grid, each uh, grid of features correspond to two modes, right? Um, so you can think of it as like, yeah, you look at the tensor from different viewpoints, okay? And then you're going to work with these uh, with these um, grids. Now, what you could do is you could do like a tension between everything and everything, but there is two problems with this. The first one being is that it doesn't work as well as if you try to incorporate what to attend to what, as we saw in, uh, in Alex's talk, where sometimes it's important to actually um, uh, like constrain what attends to what. And then the second issue is that it's more expensive, right? So these self-attention operations can be expensive. So instead, what you could do is you say, okay, like I'm going to only consider attention between um, entries of these grids that belong to the same slice, for example, right? So um, because slices of tensors have this particular meaning, as I said, like if you if you permute slices, then you conserve the rank. Then you could say, okay, like um, I, I will only do attention between these things um, because these are more related to each other 
than entries that don't belong to the same styles. Okay. So the overall system we have looks something like this. Um, so you, you, you have this tensor that you want to decompose, um, and then you apply this random change of basis, as I said, like to, to incorporate um, this, this diversity. And then you do this Monte Carlo tree search, starting from, um, uh, like you're going to do this many simulations to construct a tree. After you construct this tree, you're going to choose the best action according to some, um, like to, to some metrics. Okay, you're going to uh, go to the next uh, step by subtracting this uh, this tensor which you just showed, which you just picked, uh, and till you finish the game essentially. Okay. Now you're going to to take this game and then you're going to send it to the learner. As I said, the learner has two sources of uh, data. One source of data comes from these actors, and another source of data comes from these synthetic demonstrations. You're going to sample a random state. And then you're going to try to uh, uh, predict the policy and the value, you're going to update the model and then send it back. Okay. Um, is there any questions on that on the NCTS and so on? Yeah. So, um, there, there is a sort of symmetry that in, in, in terms of uh, the sequence of actions. Yeah. In, in that sense, you it's committed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Unless you try to three branches, <laughs> you it back. Yeah. Is there a way to leverage that? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. So uh, we did leverage it uh, in the sense that when you generate a game, right, you can generate like, you can consider that it generate actually like n factorial games, right? Because you can, can order it in any way. So we did consider like uh, permutations of that. We thought about like putting it more in the architecture, but it wasn't like, it was more of an empirical uh, thing that it didn't lead to, to much improved results. And that was, I think the, the thing that uh, Sebastian was talking about was like, sometimes you just have to test things empirically. Sometimes it's, it's useful. Sometimes it's just not useful. Yeah. I managed to have YouTube, but before that, I know what the No, we don't. That's the idea of like getting the... Uh, no, no, for two by two, yeah, we know. Yeah, yeah. So we know it's rank seven. No, rank seven. So trust is optimal. But for starting from three by three, it's unknown. So it's smaller than 23. The upper bound is 23, but the lower bound is 19. Yeah. Then we have a gap, yeah. My question is that when you do one step, I mean, when you find, uh, the, you do for one time, one, uh, one time to remove. Yeah. Um, what is the, you measure to say that this is a good move or not? Yeah, so that's exactly what the neural network is, is, is doing, right? That, that's the difficult uh, uh, problem of uh, how do you know whether you're on the right path or no? And then the neural network is providing this value function. So remember that the, that the neural network is predicting the value, right? So it's going to predict whether when you subtract this rank one tensor, is your value getting be better or no, right? So that's the, that's the whole idea of the neural network. Mm -hmm. Whatever is the notion you have this model. Sorry? Whatever is the notion you have like model, you know what is the maximum value? Uh, yeah, yeah, you have you have uh, an upper bound, but this is usually not very good. Yeah, like an n square. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So we stop the game after this upper bound um, to make sure that we don't go beyond things that we know already. Yeah. Yeah. Can you stop actually once you get one one way Oh, you oh you mean like you can stop at n minus one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Sure. sure, but it's it's usually not the the problem. Like the problem is that you have like let's say you want to put like your episode length is like one hundred and twenty or something, and then like the decisions you do at the beginning are the are the are the ones that are quite hard. So like reducing just by one is not uh, it's not going to. Any question on alpha zero? Yeah. So the U, V, and W, <coughs> Yeah, yeah. So we discretize it that way, yeah. Do you have like a calculation on the number of non zeros, like one of the No, 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 no. Like we let the agent really choose whatever it wants. 
I mean, obviously, like when you generate synthetic data, you do choose some distribution, right? So maybe it, it might like uh, indirectly bias the network towards uh, towards something. Yeah. Like how you formalize your uh, low rank optimization problem as an algebra problem? Are there any better options you see that you have? Yeah. Your microphone going for your yeah, definitely. I mean, you could you could cast it as a as a as a, an optimization problem, and this has been like very. Uh, <laughs> standard technique in the community. The problem is, uh, there are two problems with this. The first one is that you never get exact algorithms, so you never converge to zero, right? Uh, and the second thing is that if you, like it is a surprisingly hard problem in the sense that you, you have like a 16 by 16 by 16 tensor, and then you apply this um, like fancy optimization algorithms, but you actually like get stuck really quickly into a local minima. So you're not even like, uh, you don't have a small loss really. Uh, so you, you do get actually like stuck into a local minimum. So you're actually optimizing local minimum neural networks. Yeah, yeah. You're optimizing the neural network to find the conversion zero that you need. So you're, you're doing optimization that you have a neural network, yeah. not the low rank one, just to find the, the solution, the, the optimal decomposition. Yeah. But then uh, the second question, do you actually converge to zero? Yeah. yeah. Do you find the, well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, so we discretize the problem, right? So, so, so you either converge to zero or you converge to something that's not good, right? So, no, no, no. So if you, if you find a zero tensor at the end, you get an upper bound on the rank of the tensor, but you're not sure that this is going to be the optimal one. So, so okay, let me maybe go a bit through that, yeah. So in the beginning of training, what happens is that um, the alpha zero um, agent finds the classical algorithm. This, the classroom algorithm, right? So it, it does like arrive to zero at the end. But then the idea is that you want to improve over that. That's why we give a, like a negative one reward at each step. So we want to find really the shortest path. Okay, so that's in the beginning of training, this is happening, but then like throughout training, what happens is that you have this Monte Carlo tree search and like random exploration and so on that are going to improve over this, um, over this um, original algorithm that uh, that is like the classroom algorithm okay so so like what i mean is that if you get the zero tensor at the end it doesn't mean that you're optimal it just means that you find an algorithm to, to to do matrix multiplication but it might not be the optimal maybe if you continue training you're going to get better and better and that's what we see like the reward gets better and better meaning that you you, you start with an algorithm that is not very efficient and then you uh, yeah you get better at uh, you get a better computational complexity at each step Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the, I mean, yeah, the, num the number of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the number of steps needed to do matrix multiplication. Yeah. Uh, en comptant, il est quelle heure maintenant? 18? Okay. Uh, okay. So let me, I'll take five minutes because we have to connect then. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me then try to, um, um, sprint to the end. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, we train just one agent to decompose all these tensors simultaneously, okay? Uh, so you have like uh, tensors to multiply two by two times two by two and two by two times two by three and so on and so forth. So because matrix multiplication is a very well studied problem, people have been trying to optimize what is the best known uh, rank or what is the best known number of multiplications to multiply n by m times m by p matrices. Uh, we trained uh, alpha tensor, which is alpha zero applied to this problem uh, with the additional ingredients I talked about uh, and some more um, to, um, yeah. So, so we start training. So in the beginning, as I said, you get like uh, the classroom algorithm, but then it's like after a few minutes, you get the, you recover Strassen's algorithm, but then you train it, you continue to train it uh, and then you recover the other algorithms continue to train it and so on. And then at some point, it essentially like goes beyond the existing algorithms. Uh, so here, for example, for multiplying three by four times four by five, you improve the number of operations needed to do that by one. Uh, you can continue doing so. Um, and at each, uh, for, each of these, um, for each of these rows, which I highlighted here, you do improve the number of, uh, of multiplications. Okay, so th these are cases where the machine learning discovered algorithms outperform the known algorithms. 
So this one was particularly interesting to us because uh, this was the first time uh, one improves over, over Strassen's algorithm um, in any field. So here we improve it in, in, in finite fields of characteristic two. So what do these algorithms look like, right? So we tried to see, okay, like, can we interpret these? Now, this, this is how things look like. So it's extremely difficult to, to, uh, to, yeah, I think to come up with these, but it's again, like, okay, I wouldn't say it's very easy, but it's relatively easy to actually like check that they're correct. Um, we tried to do this once on the board. It was even for just one entry, it was really difficult to write everything. Uh, but yeah, you can check it using a, a program quite quite simply. Um, so uh, the algorithms we find, um, yeah, so Alpha Zero doesn't just find one algorithm. Um, like it plays, as I said, like games over and over again. So Alpha Tensor discovers like thousands of decompositions for each of these um, for each of these targets. Okay, so we open source the the, the data set of factorizations. Um, and this we, 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 we hope, and we actually like had already a lot of interesting interactions with mathematicians who think that this might uh, like lead us to understand better what is the space of possible matrix multiplication algorithms. There is another advantage to, um, to, to, to having all these diverse decompositions or diverse algorithms is that you can actually like have some sort of divan and conquer approach, combine them together to get even improved f speeds or like improved ranks for larger um, um, <coughs> tensor sizes. The approach we have is really not like um, specific to matrix multiplication. You can consider any bilinear map that you can think of, uh, and you can apply the same procedure again to decompose that tensor and so on and so forth. So we took like a, a, a bilinear map where let's say you want to multiply skew symmetric matrix vector product, and then uh, you, you can run alpha tensor on this particular, te on this particular <laughs> tensor, and then you have these, uh, these, these uh, um, uh, fast algorithms to multiply these, uh, these matrix vector products. Uh, that beat uh, existing state of the art results. So what I've talked about so far is to optimize the rank, which corresponds to the asymptotic complexity of these algorithms. Now, what you can do is that because uh, reinforcement learning is so um, generic, you can really consider any function in your uh, reward, right? You can, um, you can consider things that are as wild as the actual runtime of the algorithm on a specific hardware, right? And then you can feed that back to the reinforcement learning procedure, and then it would like guide it towards algorithms that are actually faster on that hardware that you care about. Um, in addition, like, so we added that in addition to the rank optimization. And the algorithms that you get are, um, are faster than the, known, uh, than the known algorithms on uh, the hardware, like we, we tried here V100 and TPU version two. Um, on matrices that are large enough. So like uh, we consider like 8,000 by 8,000 to 20,000 by 20,000 matrices. Um, the interesting bit is that the algorithms that you get are specifically tuned to the particular hardware. And that's what we really, really wanted to check, right? Uh, so if you take an algorithm that is optimized for um, GPU and then you test it on TPU, it's not going to be as good as if you actually like uh, find an algorithm on like, uh, optimize for an algorithm on TPU and then test it on TPU. Um, yeah, so as I said, the algorithm is tailored to the, to the target hardware. Um, yeah? yeah? So when you were looking at the reward uh, structure for, for the matrix modification, you had a reward of minus one every single yeah. time set. Yeah. Whereas here you only have a reward and very yeah. Right? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So what we did is a, a hybrid approach where we give like this minus one reward at each step, and then a, 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 like a reward again at the end if you don't find the zero tensor. But we also give uh, like as a with a like a plus lambda times a co coefficient essentially that corresponds to the to the to the runtime. We found this to be like converging much better than you know, like removing completely the rank one, uh, the, sorry, the, the rank optimization essentially. Um, yeah. So some sort of like reward shaping. Okay, so to conclude, so I guess what we're like 25? 25. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so the inspiration behind this, uh, as I said, was to say, okay, like we, we, we have developed these agents that are really good at playing games like Go, Chess, and Shogi, and so on. Now, um, I hope I convinced you that with 
um, these like tools that are similar to that, you can also attack very hard algorithmic problems, um, combinatorial problems, and problems in algorithmic discovery. Now, there is a number of limitations. Um, as I said, we, we have to discretize the search space. We do not have any optimality promise in the, in the sense that um, we do not get any lower bounds, but just upper bounds. But I think what's really um, very exciting, I think, about this approach is that it's very general, right? So, uh, so you could uh, apply it to like, prob like different problems, like different algorithmic problems. Um, uh, you could apply it to other search problems. Um, and also, in terms of objective functions, uh, as I said, you can really consider any reward, even things that are non-differentiable. Um, and wild and, and stochastic as, as, for example, the runtime. Um, yeah. So that's, that's it for my talk. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but the next speaker is going to be uh, on Zoom. So maybe let's uh, set up uh, the Zoom. Sorry? Ah, he's not yet here? Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Could you computationally extend this to bring this model? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's very fast in testing, and also very accurate in training, but how, how is it going to be? No, no, so it's actually not fasting. Mm -hmm. So. A test, so that's one of the problems where like you get an algorithm as an output and then you throw away the neural network. So I think like, uh, like maybe you, you, why you were saying that it's fast is that you were saying like the, 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 the we're trying to optimize for matrix multiplication. Is that the question? Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. 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 Run the algorithm. Yeah. Uh, you know, train your algorithm. Yeah. 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 Okay. That, that sounds good. Uh, so yeah, the the um, the training itself of reinforcement learning algorithms in general is quite yeah. It's it's, it's much more expensive than supervised learning because because you you're doing this random simulation. So so yeah, you have to do a lot of these simulations essentially. So uh, at each step, for example, what we did is like 1,600 simulations. So you can you have to like call uh, 1,600 times at least the neural network uh, to take to take the next step. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you have to parallelize over different computers. Uh, it's a distributed framework. So yeah, there is some engineering overhead, obviously, for reinforcement learning and alpha zero in particular. Well, it depends. It depends, really, because again, like even for uh, it depends what you want to do with training network. So if you want to again, like run MCTS, because at inference time you also have to run MCTS, then that wouldn't be affordable, right? But the 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 output of the algorithm, which is like like written in code, that you can use it essentially. But the the inference itself, it's um, it's it, yeah, it's it, you need to do this 1,600 simulations and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you need to train. Yeah. Testing. Uh, whatever, yeah. So we I think we discretize to minus two, <laughs> minus one, zero, one, two. But we didn't allow four or minus four, but this is something we can do. Do you have intuitions on one? No, no, we have two and minus two. Yeah, so. Yeah. Do you think we can generalize this to like more like the diverse task for algorithms? I mean, here in monkey matrix, can you write any like any task for algorithm that will run the the sensor decomposition? So in general, no. So the the like the short answer is no. But so okay, like there is like let's say you want to 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 make an ein sum or something like uh, like any ein sum operation, for example, uh, or like a multilinear operation. So you could write it as a tensor, and then you could do the same approach and so on. But 
like the idea of like um, using reinforcement learning for uh, your for a completely different task, it might also be amenable to some uh, conversion to, a, to, to to some object, just like tensors and so on. So there are some problems that have the same flavor. Um, now, th this particular problem, I think, was interesting for us to study because whenever you get an algorithm for multiplying fixed size matrices, you can apply these recursively to any size matrices, right? So, so that's, I think, the constraint. But like, I would think that any problem that falls under this category might be, might be able to, uh, to tackle it using this problem, like that has some structure, recursive structure like that. Um, the determinant, yeah, you can do the same, yeah, because it's a, it's a, it's a multilinear. I mean, the, the existing algorithm is not factorial. Thank, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's polynomial. So um, now the permanent. So if you're able to to find fast algorithms for the permanent of matrices, then you essentially solve p versus LP. <laughs> So you mean that adding this at the optimization level or at the, to have algorithms for matrix multiplication are faster? Yeah. 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 I mean, you could you could combine as as, as combine. yes yes. I mean, when you have this tree search, you know, like you could add. Uh, prior information about, for example, uh, should you visit this branch or not, right? Yeah. So currently, currently we're using learning to to essentially decide whether to um, to uh, explore this branch or not. But you, if you have like a, a better kind of like heuristics, then definitely you can embed that in and then have only learning uh, treat the cases that you don't know how to be. <laughs> there is no work that I think published. No, I, I mean as far as I know. No. 